But it's also possible to say, well, let's then consider a rescue at some point in that cycle. So you've got a crisis and the government then comes in and injects $100 billion one year into the crisis. But what if I do the, rather than giving it to the banks, what if I give it to the debtors instead? And Obama argued against this when he spoke in his speech in April, defending the, his government's economic plan, drafted by the people who caused the crisis, Summers and Geithner and so on. And the argument was, giving it to the banks will create ten times as much money. Okay, multiplier effect. Now I'm going to give it to the, to the debtors. I'm going to do what Obama said, he, new people said they wanted to do, but it was wiser to give it to the banks. This is doing what Obama said was unwise, according to his economic advisers. Same point of time, same amount of money, going to the debtors. You get a lot more bang for your buck for giving it to the debtors, not the banks. And the reason fundamentally is simple. If you imagine the system as a series of reservoirs, then the bankers have suddenly constricted their outflow. And if you put the money in there, the water will build up. But if you put it to the debtors, they've expanded their outflow. If you drop the money into their lake, it'll move out more quickly into the rest of the system. So thinking dynamically gives you a very different vision of what's going to work as a way of reforming the economy from the crisis it gets into. But that only works if the credit crunch is the only problem we have. We also have an enormous debt overhang. And I don't believe you can paper over that one because every, every return we've ever had to economic growth has involved a rising level of debt to GDP in the last 20 or so years. And now we have a level of debt which is beyond anything we've ever experienced in our history. All sectors of the economy except the government are carrying more debt than they've ever done in Australia's history. Business debt's bigger than it was in 1990. Household debt's five times what it was compared to income in 1990. Only government debt's got any room to grow. And a similar thing applies across the whole OECD. When you look across the OECD, the only nation that doesn't have a history of rising ratio of debt to GDP in the last three decades is France. Which is, therefore, it's not to me ironic at all that France is the first country to record positive growth in the major OECD nations. It didn't have a debt crisis, that's why. Now, what I fear is happening in the future and what the government is fighting against right now, albeit successfully in Australia, though not as successfully in America, is deleveraging. If you think about the amount of money you can spend on your own life, on your own working life, it's the sum of what you earn plus your change in debt. Now, if you're forever increasing your debt levels, you've got an additional boosted spending power. But what if you get into a debt situation where you have to reduce your spending and pay your debt down? You then reduce your consumption drastically. Well, that happens at the national level as well. If you take a look back at the 1890s, when we got into the debt bubble and had the turnaround that gave us the, the depression of the 1890s, the rate of reduction of debt was roughly 4% per annum. If you look in the 1930s, uh, on average it worked out to being 8% per annum, including a little government policy called the Second World War, of course, to reduce the debt level. Not one I want to see repeated. What I'm doing now is taking our current debt levels and saying, well, let's take a look at those two extremes. What if we reduce debt at that 4% per annum rate, starting from where it is now at one and, three, one and two thirds times GDP? Then it would take us 30 years to get back to where we were in 1980, which is above the level we had between the two wars uh, and, uh, and in the early post-war period when we had probably the best economic performance in our history. If we did the 8% rate, that would start at being a 12% reduction in GDP. That's how much we'd need to reduce demand to actually pay debt down that much. And that would take us 12 years to get back to the 1980 level. Now, a similar story applies only worse in America because their debt level is 1.7 times ours. And the trouble they're fighting against is the impact that that deleveraging is having right now on employment. The blue line is unemployment turned upside down and graphed on the left, on the right hand axis, on the uh, yeah, right hand axis as you face it. Um, to show the correlation between the contribution that the change in debt makes to demand each year, which is the red line, and the unemployment rate. That correlation started off quite low and debt levels were relatively low. They still explain 61% uh, of the data and it's now in explaining 80, about 85% of the data. So unemployment in America has been driven by deleveraging. And to give an idea of the scale of that, in 2006 the increase in private debt in America peaked at $4.5 trillion on a $14 trillion economy. So total demand was $18.5 and $4.5 trillion of that was debt finance, over 20%. This year, the rate of deleveraging, which has been driven by the financial sector, surprise, surprise, is running at about $2.5 trillion. So they've gone from debt, extra debt adding, adding $4.5 trillion to demand to falling debt subtracting $2.5 trillion from demand. It's a $7 trillion turnaround in a $14 trillion economy.
It's no wonder America is struggling. We don't have quite the same scale and we've actually started to lever up again. So Ponzi Dundee is in the saddle once more. If you look back at the 72 and 74 bust and the 84 and, 80 and uh, 84 and 92 period, you can see we only got a sustained turnaround from rising unemployment when the debt bubble began once more. Now one thing I've uh, realised by looking at this data is just how much this explains of Australian economic history and political history as well. I'm sorry Jenny's not here anymore, I have somebody from the ALP is here. Uh, but if you take a look at the debt to GDP ratio and go back to 1972, of course prior to the election of the Whitlam government, you'll see a debt bubble began that year. If that debt bubble had kept going, that's tracking the blue line there, Australia's debt to GDP ratio would now be 103, not percent, times. Now, obviously, we couldn't sustain that growth path. Therefore, that had to turn around, and I believe the bursting of that debt bubble is what sank the Whitlam government. They didn't even know it was happening. They, it was mainly associated with the building boom in Sydney at the time. The next bubble, starting in, in uh, about 84, 85, was, of course, the, uh, when we thought uh, uh, that Keating was the world's greatest treasurer, as opposed to Costello, who became the greatest treasurer afterwards. And that increase in debt also would have us at a huge level of debt now, 372% of GDP, that bubble had kept on going. It had to burst as well. That's what gave us the 1990s recession. We only got recoveries out of each of those downturns when the debt ratio began to rise again. So notice there's the takeoff in the debt ratio and there's our fall in the unemployment rate. Same story under Costello and, and Howard. Increasing debt ratio, falling unemployment rate, turning around at the end. Now what odds are that we're going to repeat that process yet again and go to a higher level of debt? I was gambling to say I don't think it's going to happen again and I don't want to be here if I'm wrong. I think it's more likely to be this direction, deleveraging as happened back in the 1890s and the 1930s. And then it's a totally different economic environment, one that no one alive has had any policy input into. Now unfortunately we are succeeding in turning that debt level around. If you take a look at the debt ratio and say how long did it take us to get from the peak level to when we started to rise once more, then it took a couple of years in 1970, it took several years in the 1990s, but the turnaround now has taken less than a year. I don't see that as a good thing. The trouble is, it's mainly households that are doing it. We already have a higher ratio of household debt to GDP than applies in America and that ratio was trending down, the first time, what I call the first time vendors grant has now boosted it back up again. Now what happens when it gets pulled out? Well, we'll find that out next year. And back in the United States, they're trying similar chicks. They've also, of course, got a first time buyer's grant over there. That actually is a buyer's grant. It goes to the buyers rather than the, uh, the borrowers. They're praying for a rapid turnaround on the basis that whenever there's a big slump, there's an equally big boom out of it afterwards. And Ed Lazare, who was chairman of Bush's Council of Advisors in 2006 to 2009, speaking at the Economist Conference, claimed that he expected 5% growth next year on that basis. Now, if you take a look at his report in 2009 to the incoming Obama government, he drew this correlation relationship between the scale of the downturn and the scale of the subsequent boom in the, in the next eight quarters. But there's a slight little trick to that data. Take a good look at it and you'll see there's a time trend. I've embedded the, the, the years prompt, uh, in, into the past that each of those particular data points he used were. Nine, 52 years ago was the most extreme one. Nine years ago was the one down the bottom. There's a time trend. When you factor the time trend as well, in as well, that argument you make is non-sustainable. Most of the big recovery, big bust, big recovery pairs occurred in the early post-war period when you had low debt levels. As debts got to be larger, each new boom has been lower than the one beforehand. And when you take a look at that in detail and say, when did the downturn occur, how big was the growth rate level afterwards, this is the chart you get. You can see, even without needing any stats to help you, the trend of the red line is down. The booms are less extreme. The busts have got less for a while, but now we're into the, to a mother of all busts. And the orange lines show the average rate of growth. It's declined over a percent over that period of time. So to expect history to repeat itself, meaning the post-war period, I think is being delusional. The history is going to repeat itself, but it's the rhyming history from the 1930s when deleveraging ruled the roost. And that's why I'm still what you might call a bear. Thank you.